Amazon Prime has begun the journey of unveiling the mysteries that lay within Middle-earth's second age in their new series, The Rings of Power. Following the rise of Sauron after centuries of slumber will be worth skipping a few Hobbit suppers. So to help you keep up, let's detail 10 things that you might have missed in episodes 1 and 2. You need not know the dark tongue of Mordor to understand that there will be spoilers ahead. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into it. In episode 1, we're introduced to Gladriel as she's narrating a memory of herself as a child. Now, she will later on in life go on to complete her elder brother's vow in The Hobbit, and she's going to be one of the few named characters that we see in later movies. But everything that happens in this series takes place thousands of years before even the first Hobbit finds themselves wandering to the Shire. See those two giant trees there? Well, that's Telperion and Lorelin. We watch both of them die at the hands of Ongoliant and Morgoth, a giant spider, and, I cannot stress this enough, the literal source of all evil everywhere. If you wanted more fuel for your arachnophobia, we've got plenty. Anyways, the seeds from these trees are what birth the sun and the moon. And here's a little bonus thing. The land of Valinor is also the home of Aloran, though you probably know this wise old man better as Gandalf. In the northern icy wasteland of Fordordwaith, Galadriel finds the insignia of Sauron and fights a snow troll. This is the first time that we've seen anything of a snow troll. As Tolkien was already not too keen to write about the Second Age that much, and even less so this specific subsection of troll. Which, on the plus side, gives the show some comfortable breathing room when it comes to the following canon. While we know that the original race of trolls would be petrified in stone by sunlight, later ones lost this limitation. So keep your eyes peeled, because for all we know, these guys turned to ice instead of stone. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not actually, though. No, these friendly little guys, obsessed with eating, with big hairy feet, and an aversion to danger, are not actually hobbits. Tolkien again blesses us posthumously by keeping early hobbit history vague. We know that they descend from people closer to men in the Valley of Anduin, but that's it. Luckily, we start with the Harfoots, the very ones who spread out and slowly lead to people like Smeagol and the rambunctious Baggins family. Elrond is probably the most well-known elf, second only to Legolas, maybe. If for nothing else than the amazing eyebrows of Hugo Weaving. This is indeed the same Elrond that will plead with Isildur, who may or may not be on that boat at the end of episode 2. He will also be the wielder of Vilya, one of the three untampered by Sauron. A ring which, while being the more powerful of the three, always held vague abilities. Which the show sort of answers, as his ability for sight seemed to be inherent. Continuing the trend for famous elves, we have Gilgalad. He is one of, if not the first wielder of the titular Rings of Power. In fact, if it was not for his specific direction, as we see in episode 1, these rings may never have been forged in the first place. His death and passing of Vilya to Elrond are arguably a fundamental point in the turning of the ages. The Rings of Power slather itself in foreshadowing whenever these two share the screen. Celebrimbor was a magnificent blacksmith, rivaled only by Feanor before him, who created the Silmarils. We actually see the Silmarils as they lay in decoration on a table in Celebrimbor's office. The Silmarils are jewels that hold the light from the original trees we talked about not that long ago, the ones with the spider. This easily sets up the rise of Sauron. The one object motif is plainly mirrored here. How Feanor met his end? Hubris, at the hands of a Balrog. If only he had a giant stick and angelic powers. What better people to make a forge worthy of Sauron himself than the dwarves hidden deep in the mountains? We've actually seen these dwarves before. Maybe not looking so alive, but you know. The Mines of Moria are one of the most splendid dwarven cities, and in the original film trilogy, it is left abandoned and ruined. As you're watching the show, if you pay attention, you can even see the bridges where Gandalf will eventually fall to his death and then, you know, come back later. The chest in episode 2 of this show was the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. Kind of. Same idea. I think it's safe to assume that what the two Durins are coveting is the Arkenstone, a bedazzling jewel that was cut by the talented hands of dwarves to reflect all light that touched it. How can we be so sure? Well, the possession of the stone acts almost like the Silmarils, with it producing its own light, and the rings having not been forged yet, dwarven greed will only grow from here. So, this is just speculation, but that broken sword of Sauron that Theo picks up looks awfully familiar. The flaming pillar coming from the top, the affinity it has for blood, half-elf blood? Possibly, we never did see those ears. It could be the very same one used by the Nazgul known as the Witch King. Okay, the ring wraiths were a group of men that were given rings, slowly corrupted to be bound by them, and the Witch King has a unique weapon that literally thirsts for blood and has its own pyrotechnical display, so it actually fits. 
And that's it for now. There's so much more that we could talk about, but there are only so many hours between 11 Z's and luncheon, and my stomach is growling. The Rings of Power has started off jam-packed with hidden meanings and references, and we can't wait to see it flourish in its own epic way. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to Screen Rant for more great videos just like this in the future.